Panasonic booth at CES. I'm joined by Matt Fraser from Panasonic and filmmaker Griffin Hammond. And we're here today to talk about, surprise, surprise, GH5. Um, Griffin, you've been using this, this camera. Um, how long for? I've been shooting on the GH5 for a month now. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the whole point of this conversation, we thought, you know, we've been through the tech specs, you know, it, it's great. If you're a geek, geek out as much as you like, but what's it really like to use this camera? Well, as a filmmaker, I didn't even think I needed in-body image stabilization, but when I'm shooting on a Prime like this that doesn't have it built in, and when I'm shooting in 4K and when you blow it up, you would normally see a little bit of handheld jitter, and so having that was really nice, just it got rid of that shake. And your, your style is very much um, handheld. Very handheld. We're going to run yeah. some video, show a little bit of what you shot with the camera. Yeah. Hopefully over this, as yeah. we're talking <laughs> now. Um, what, what, what sort of lenses are we seeing being used here? I shot a lot with this 12 millimeter f1.4 lens. I shot with the 42.5 millimeter. That's a lens that, even though it has built-in image stabilization, probably needs the additional help just because it's such a tight lens. Um, so I shot with those primes a lot because I'm shooting in low light situations, but I also really like the 12 to 35 millimeter as like a documentary lens. Okay, and um, have you tried the new 12 to 35, or is that just the one? The, no, the, I have the, the existing one. And was most of that documentary shot manual focus or AF? A little bit of both. Um, I use push to focus, like single area focus a lot. Um, I'll focus right before I shoot. And then uh, I also will do manual focus when I need to follow. So I'll use focus peaking. Okay, um, and did you find the AF... Well, how did you find the AF compared? You've used the GH4, GH3, GH2, so how is it? Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it worked just as well. I, I don't know, I think it's faster, but uh, to, to me, I just push the button and it works, so. Did you try the focus transition feature? Is that I working? I did play with that. It's not something I need, although I'm interested in it from like an effect standpoint. Like I could shoot the same shot multiple times on a tripod if I know the focus is going to change the exact same speed each time. Okay, um, in terms of, uh, well, we, we, talk, we touched on low light there for a second, how is it in low light? I mean, a lot of that film is in low yeah. light, so how, how is it? Yeah, I mean, I was in bars, and I was never shooting above 1600. Uh, it seemed like I was getting all the detail I needed there. and not Did you try much. pushing it any further? I didn't need to. Um, I mean, it looked fine. But in comparison to your GH4, for instance, what are you seeing? It was hard for me to compare because I was shooting in 60p this time, and so I was filming with half the shutter speed that I normally would. I was worried that that would be like too low light, but it seemed like it was fine. I got everything I needed. I mean, from the official Panasonic perspective, uh, what are you saying in terms of low light performance? Well, so I, th I think one of the things people have to realize is that the GH4 was cropped in a bit. It was a 2-3 crop. And by going to the full width of the sensor, we're getting more light from the lens anyways. And our engineers are saying that's naturally giving us one stop. So you're gonna, if you were happy at 800, just that lens change alone and that crop change gets you a stop. I'm finding personally when I'm working with it, there's close to another stop of light gathering that we're getting or, or lack of noise that we're getting as well. So I feel really comfortable with that camera. You know, 3200 for me is what I was kind of used to with that 800 to 1000 range on the GH4. Yeah. And, and how do you think that works with the different gammas? I mean, you know, people, the recommendation if you use a Sony is you don't shoot log at high ISO because you know it gives you problems. Um, you've got more bits to play with. Yeah. Are you still recommending people not to shoot log in, in 3200, for instance? Or? I don't. That that's a difficult question to answer because people's threshold for what's acceptable for noise can vary wildly. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem here. I think you're going to be okay at, you know, ISO 2000. I certainly would be very comfortable there shooting in log. Um, I know people tend to want to shoot to the right a bit anyways, and then they can hide their noise in the, in the shadows. I think if you follow those basic rules and stick to 2000, based on what I'm seeing, I th I'm very happy with it there. I think the bigger issue, frankly, was that with the GH4, you were dealing with an 8-bit codec and a logarithmic gamma that was really designed around Vericam, Vericam 35, Vericam LT. Those extra bits of information, I think, are just going to prove invaluable for log shooters in general. And then, of course, if you want to go the whole hog, you can stick an Atomos on top and get your 10-bit. So let's be clear, what do you, what do you get externally with, uh, with, with this camera and, um, and a recorder? Okay, so let's say, I'll, first off, I think we probably want to talk about Inferno because the Inferno can do uh, 60 frame per second recording and it can do 10-bit 422. The GH5 can output 10-bit 422 
at 60 frames per second. I think that immediately makes the Inferno probably the de facto choice that you would have. I think the second piece is that um, with 60p internal 8-bit, you're also going to be tethered to an IPB codec. Um, if I want to use an all intracodec of some type at 60p, I'm going to want to use that output and use an Inferno as well for that. Um, you know, other than that, you know, we're talking about a, a firmware update that'll get you 400 megabit per second, all intra, up to 30 frames in 4K. Internal. Yeah, and that's all internal. So I think that somewhat mitigates the need for an external re uh, monitor. But keep in mind with external monitoring, recording solutions, the tools for like waveform monitor and false color. You know, we've added waveform monitor and vector scope, but you know, there is a real advantage to using the waveform monitors that are built into a Convergent Designs product or the Atomos product, um, just because they cover the entire screen. They give you scale information, so I can work a little quicker with that. And frankly, when I shoot, I prefer false color. Um, I'm, I'm like a I'm a noob out there. I know you guys love your your waveform monitors. I really love re looking at false color. I just think it's easier for me to read. And we don't offer a false color, and so that's clearly a benefit to an Atomos product. Okay, um, we talk, staying on the no light, um, Metabone speed boosters, incredibly popular using Canon lenses, Nikon lenses with these cameras. Um, but with the larger sensor, there's some debate about what you're going to be able to use uh, in terms of a speed booster. What, what, have you tested different speed boosters on this camera? All right, so <laughs> Full, di full disclosure, I don't have an XL to be able to test, which I think is the, the this is the adapter we're talking about. It's yes. the 0.64 or whatever. It's, we've not tested it, so I can't speak to that. Um, we I mean, have, were, there, were, there, were there speed boosters that had vignetting in photo mode? So there, the so that's the, yeah, so that's yeah. There's so there's different versions of it depending on how big the sensor was, right. and whether you're using a black magic camera or with a 60 millimeter sensor. So, what I would suggest that that viewers do is to get the XL adapter on their GH4 and uh, take it out of the movie mode and put it into a photo mode right. and do a few photographs. And if it's not vignetting in that mode, it's not going to vignette on the GH5 right. at all. Because you're and talking. Even if it is vignetting a little bit in photo mode when we just take out some of that vertical resolution, you might lose it. Well, or if you go to, you can always set the camera to 16 by nine photography. So yeah. if you set the camera to 16 by nine photography, go ahead and put the XL on there, or whichever speed booster you're trying to, to work you're with. You're reasonably confident it should work. I mean, there might be the odd lens. Yeah, you know, the you odd know from what I've seen, because I've, I've, you know, I, I ran the GH5 into a store I trust, and I borrowed one of the adapters that had the, the, wider, the, the wider crop, and I couldn't get it to vignette, but I'm not using the, you know, I'm not using the 50, oh, sorry, a, a 50 millimeter F1.2, you know, Canon. I'm not using an, I'm sorry, an 85 F1.2 Canon or a 35 F1.2 Canon, so I can't speak to how much vignetting is going to be there. Well, and you could just get a GH4 right now, shoot in 1080, and it should be the same field of view. Yeah, that would also be the, that. Would also yeah. be uh, I mean, the only other question, I suppose, if you if you turn on the sensor shift, presumably you lose you you run the risk of a bit more vignette as it moves side to side. Yeah, you would you would be more vulnerable to it, obviously, because it can move within that framing. I mean, but you uh, can turn it off. Obviously, you know, one solution is disengage it. Yeah. I mean, not ideal if you want sensor shift, but at least you can still shoot that way. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, yes, you are correct. We'd have to do that. Okay. Um, other things. I mean, what, do you, what else do you like about this? You know, what, what are your what are, what are your favorite things about this camera? My favorite things might be that so much of it is the same as the GH4, which I loved. Like the battery is the same, so I don't have to deal with that. Um, battery life. The battery life is a little bit lower than the GH4, just because it's more powerful. But I found I never needed more than two of these for a whole day of shooting. Wow. I mean, these are already good batteries. I thought. Can you shoot quite heavily? I mean, how many hours do you shoot? How many hours of the camera be on? That That's thing? probably the camera on for for five or six hours. Um, I'm not recording all that time, but okay, take that, Sony. <laughs> yeah, the battery life is great. Um, it has full size HDMI for, for people that want that. I didn't think I'd want two dual SD cards. I thought that was kind of like a professional photography solution, but actually, it turned out for me. It's helpful that I can allocate photos to one card for time lapses, video to the other. So just from an organization standpoint. Uh, but the fact that, I mean, really the image, image stabilization was the biggest for me. And then just being able to shoot 60p at 4K is really cool. Um, ergonom ergonomics and controls, are you, are you happy with the way the, these, these, these dials work out? Yeah. I mean, it's a really, it feels really good in your hand. And it's, they didn't change too much. About where the buttons are placed, and it, but it, I think it feels even a little bit better than the GH4. And you, are you triggering off the shutter button, or are you doing it off this red button here? I, I do the red button actually. Uh, I guess I was used to doing it with my thumb before, but uh, I can still reach that just fine. 
Okay. Um, Audio-wise, what were you doing for audio for the doll? Uh, I was recording with an external recorder, the Zoom H5. Uh, I didn't yet have the, the built-in XLR adapter. Um, Is that something you're excited about, the XLR adapter? I am, yeah. I mean, I do natural sound on the camera. I'm comfortable using, for B-roll, the sound I get on the microphone. But when I'm doing an interview, I want to use a shotgun mic, and often a phantom-powered shotgun mic, so I traditionally would need an external recorder for that. Okay. Um, Matt, if you were, can I borrow that for a yeah. second? One question that I have been asked a lot online is, does this thing allow you to magnify the image while you're actually recording? Because, you know, for obvious reasons, you want to check your focus. Check focus is, is that possible? Unfortunately, it's just not possible. The way that we, the way the information is being written, uh, the magnification would end up actually being written to the card. It's just where it is within the processing of the camera. So we just don't have the ability to do a punch in focus while you're recording. But you have got the, the better viewfinder with, with the OLED. I mean, how is the OLED viewfinder compared to the GH4s? I'm actually not a viewfinder guy. I'm an LCD shooter, um, but I do think that the viewfinder is higher res. <laughs> I just don't need it. Okay. I, I'll speak to that. Trust me, guys. I don't, I'm not some <laughs> show for pan. I'm joking, obviously. Um, look, when, that was the first thing I noticed in the camera was when I put it to my eye for the first time. I, I, I used curse words and enthusiasm. It's that much better. It is a 50% increase in resolution. Mm. You don't really understand how much better it is until you look through this thing. It is astoundingly good. And so combined with peaking, it should help you get critical focus better than the GH4? Right, and I think, you know, I, I, I think for some shooters who are log shooters, one of the reasons they want punch in is because, you know, you can't trust focus peaking when you're shooting log, and you really can't trust your eye when you're shooting log because it's so darn flat. And we're incorporating now a LUT preview in the camera. And there's four presets, so you can add LUTs as long as they're formatted in Panasonic's. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So what's the? these are the same LUTs as the Vericam, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So you, would, you, could, you, can take your old, you can take all your Vericam LUTs or whatever LUTs have been created for Vericam. And as long as they're in the same um, language as what the Vericam would understand, you'll be able to pull them into the GH. And is there a simple tool to take other sort of 3D LUTs and convert them into that that you know of? Uh, not that I know of, but I'm assuming that they exist. Somebody will. Yeah. It'll, I'm sure It'll, that by the time this launches, there'll be countless LUTs available to buy online. No, it's never going to happen, ever. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, it'll probably happen. Yeah, okay. Um, was there anything else that you, you found with this camera that uh, you didn't quite, I wouldn't say did dislike, but what, what, did anything irk you slightly with this camera? I mean, I think at first, just I had to get used to the record button being in a different place, but uh, I was worried that it would be heavier, uh, and it is heavier, but it's not really noticeable when I'm shooting. Um, you didn't try dropping it or anything yet? I didn't try dropping it, no. I also hear it's freeze-proof, which I don't n even know why I would need that. But <laughs> Well, you were in that ice shed. <laughs> I know. I'm not leaving it in there, though. No. <laughs> um, it didn't give you any problems in the cold, though? No, no, definitely not. So it probably is freeze-proof. Well, yeah. let's be clear. He's being very nice. He was on a really rough set of beta firmware on it. I'm sure that he had some challenges <laughs> periodically. With I mean, it. every once in a while there were things I would do that would crash, but nothing that actually stopped me from recording. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, we, I, I can tell you, I can speak for Luke Newman because he, you know, when we first got him his sample, uh, it wasn't doing 10 bits. <laughs> so he, he had to call me and figure that out. We forgot to load a log profile for him so that he could work with log. You know, there were obviously going to be challenges when we're dealing with prototypes, but um, from my frustration, it's still, we're not quite optimized yet on the autofocus systems. And f from what I saw originally, when people are here at the show and they're kind of playing with the autofocus, they have no idea how much better it's actually going to be when it's finalized. The autofocus system, I think, is going to blow some people away. Okay, um, before we get it, I'm gonna, we're going to end quite soon, but very quickly, um, 6K, 6K photo. Um, yes. Let's make sure we clarify that 6K photo. Yeah. Uh, first, we'll get to 6K anamorphic in a minute, perhaps, but the 6K photo, did you try using that at all? No. I don't even know if that's ready on my firmware. Possibly not. Um, do you see it being a, you know, a viable alternative for photographers and to normal photography? Okay, so for photographers, we've been selling 4K photo for, you know, three years now, and... Um, it hasn't, to be, to be fair, I don't think, not just you, but every manufacturer has struggled to get that adopted, but now you've got that bump in resolution so you know maybe is that is that enough to well the number one complaint we always got was that it's only eight megapixels um, at 18 megapixels if, if you can't get your project done at 18 megapixels then I don't really know what you're shooting um, maybe you need a Hasselblad I guess but um, 
we think that's going to be a big improvement. But we've noticed a huge in increase in acceptance of 4K photo from people for shooting in general. So we think photographers are really going to like this feature, especially at 30 frames per second. If you can't get your moment, then you know. Well, I guess it depends what you're shooting as well. I mean, it's something that right. moves quickly right. there's a clear benefit. And I think video shooters will find use for it. Um, you know, what's what's different is that it's in a four by three aspect ratio, so or or three two. But what I like people to consider it for is if you're shooting stuff where you don't necessarily know where your framing is supposed to be, yeah. you're getting so much resolution now that a crop in post becomes very easy to be able to do. So and one example that a DP had brought to me was that um, he was on a shoot and he was shooting on a camera 16 by 9 sensor and he was frustrated because the stunt driver overshot where he was supposed to shoot and he had to rack his camera up to be able to get the shot in frame. Well, he wanted to shoot open gate, which would have been, you know, on film you'd shoot open gate and you wouldn't have to worry about it, you just crop it later. Um, this facilitates open gate shooting now, so yeah. you can go ahead and crop later, which I think is a really powerful tool. Yeah, absolutely, um, especially in a documentary context where you you know, you're moving quickly, you know, framing isn't always all quite perfect. I think, yeah. for me, just having a little bit at the top and bottom would be a really nice safety well, yeah. net. When you're shooting an interview and someone moves up or down or left or right, yeah. Yeah, or even for drone operators, I, it would be great if it was 60 frame for a drone to be perfect, but even a 30 frame provides you with a lot of extra real estate for you to be able to crop through and post. Yeah, okay. And then, 6K anamorphic, um, do we know much what, what do you know? What, what are you able to say at the moment? Okay, so we're actually calling it high-resolution anamorphic, um, and, and that's because it's not 6K. It's not, it's not you know, 5760 across. It's not 6,000 pixels across. Um, it is roughly 51,000, well, 5,100 pixels sideways. So we're calling it high-resolution anamorphic. If you want to call it 5K anamorphic, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, we'll add it as a firmware update, you know, sometime in the summer. Uh, this will be one of the highest-resolution anamorphic modes that you can get. Um, I think what's going to be interesting is it uses H.265. It's the only video function in the camera that uses H.265. So I'm very interested to see what the results are going to look like with it. From what I've seen with the 6K photo function thus far, it looks very good. Uh, you know, at this point, you're getting a sensor that's effectively taller than an F55 or an F5. So if you were to shoot an F5 or F55 in anamorphic, Technically, you're getting a larger sensor with a GH5 than you would be with that camera. Frankly, larger than a lot of the RED product is as well. So unless you're shooting an Arri Alexa XT, chances are this is your second best anamorphic solution if you're trying to shallow depth of field. And it may be that a lot of those people who are shooting on those big cameras may turn to this as a B camera, C camera, F camera. Oh yeah, blow absolutely. it up, counter camera. Or dash, you know, if you need yeah. to do something on a dashboard and you want to maintain anamorphic look, a lot of people are frankly shooting spherical and then cropping for that stuff and they'd much just because of size limitations and cost and budget that they have to work with this facilitate facil, that's an easy word to say facilitates anamorphic in, in tighter working conditions and certainly at lower costs I think a lot of people would I, I get a ton of people who talk about music video work and how much they'd love to be able to shoot anamorphic but they can't even afford the rental fee for a week on the camera that will, that will be able to facilitate it let alone the lenses that they want to work with You've got optics that are really affordable now that are available for purchase, or you can rent, you know, Koa anamorphics at a reasonable price, and your GH5 is going to facilitate that workflow. So, and it's a four, it's four by three, the sensor, sensor is it exactly four by three? Or? Yeah, four thirds is four by three by its nature. So, it, and, and again, the key here is that that's the same aspect ratio as the Arri Alexa XT. It's very close to Academy. Academy was what technically one point three seven five to one. This is one three three to one. So good with two X, but also usable with you know, um, if you want to go out sixteen nine finished, you can shoot one three one three three. three. Yeah, yeah, one three three gets you about a two to one crop. So yeah, you could do that as well. So lots of options there. A two to one um, crop. A two to one. External recording with that mode is that a no go? Yeah, I've got it set up right here now. So um, now six K photo, we won't know for sure about that until I've tested it, uh, and I've never asked if it can do the output. But again, why would? The HDMI out is going to be limited anyways to 3840 by 2160. If you're going to use an external recorder, you would never have it in the high resolution anamorphic mode. Right. Um, you would just put it into the standard. But would you be able to monitor it? You, ha you, you can. If you, that's the big. Yeah, kind we're of going question. to have to wait until that 
that firmware is finalized. I have not seen it operating to be able to answer that. So fingers crossed on that one. Fingers crossed, yes. Okay, gentlemen, that's been very illuminating. Um, thank you very much. And if people want to find out more about what you do, where, where can they where, where can they head? I think you just go to griffinhammond.com and you'll see all my GH5 videos there. Okay, I've had a look, lots of good, good information if you're a GH user. Uh, and Matt, thank you very much. Thank so you very much. That's it from us. See you soon.